Welcome to your favorite YouTube channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Jimmy, today we got a big guest, man. Uncle Mike Allred is here. If you will just lay down some of that bibliography, let's jump right into the conversation. All right, man. Some of his books include Madman, Sandman, Atomics, X-Force, and Ecstatics, iZombie. Boy, there's a lot of hits on this list. Fantastic Force, Bowie, uh, Mike Allred. You've been a busy guy, dude. Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. Uh, thanks. I've wanted to do this for a long time. As we just experienced, my technical savvy is so lacking, and I've always been nervous about this, but I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, thanks so much for joining us, man. And, uh, you know, you got a real strong cut to your jib, real handsome fella. One of the things that I was always curious about was uh, how the heck do you get into drawing comics, man? There's like a certain kind of persuasion that is attracted to the medium, but you kind of fly in the face of that a bit. I don't know, and I'm always taken back when people say stuff like that because I am I'm, I'm the ultimate nerd and always have been. Um, I mean, I... Uh, you know, I did sports and stuff, but not because uh, it, it was kind of a way to not have to to be home and doing chores. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I was going to ask, to, to be blunt, like I was curious, like were you maybe a rotund young, uh, young boy or something like that? <laughs> maybe you spent a lot of time indoors learning to draw? Uh, not really. Uh, actually, our child, childhood, it was kind of like, uh, there was a lot of Tarzan to it. We were had a willow tree in the back and climbed it and swung from vine to vine. And um, we were allowed to run loose on the hilltop. And uh, my mom had a cowbell for us to come back for dinner. So we were just set loose. And our, uh, our dogs were never leashed. Uh, this is Roseburg, Oregon growing up, which is, I live in Eugene now. Uh, so about an hour south of here is where I grew up. And it was a perfect leave it to beaver childhood in my mind and then uh then my parents got divorced when i was 11 and um everything changed um all, all of a sudden well my older brother lee which is he is the reason why i love comic books and uh, then our younger brother curtis they went uh back to utah where my mom was born and raised and i lee and i were allowed to choose to whether to go with mom or stay with dad and I wanted to stay with dad and did. And so then my life turned into a courtship of Eddie's father kind of life. And dad would drop me off at the movies and uh, take me to the movies as well. Like I remember him taking me to uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey and that was one of the greatest experiences of my life. And so dad and I had a really great relationship. Then when he remarried, um, things kind of fell apart. I, I slipped into uh, puberty and became a juvenile delinquent. Um, but the one mainstay has been comic books and rock and roll. Dang. And rock and roll came from when our older cousin Robin was sent to live with us when my parents were still together. And because she was getting in trouble, they were worried about her getting pregnant with this boyfriend she was serious with. And, and she uh, roomed with me and brought her record collection. So I had this amazing um introduction to music that i wouldn't have otherwise that was you know much older than me and and uh, gave me this great history lesson on music lee on the other hand um and i even asked him recently why how did you get into comics and how were you introduced to comics and and uh i guess they were like at waiting rooms and uh, uh and stuff like that but he always had the He's literally a genius and always had the, the foresight to, and the uh, courage to ask our parents to get us this stuff. And so when we would be out and about and uh, would be over to the spinner rack and whatnot, um, I would grab cheesy kid stuff, uh, stuff I still appreciate like hot stuff, you know, the, the Harvey comics, that sort of thing. But he always grabbed the great stuff. And then after I quickly got through my stuff, his stuff was uh, attractive. What's that, what's that era? Is that like Fourth World? Oh, uh, Fourth World, we were introduced at our uh, guitar teacher. So that was, uh, and he had a waiting room. 
And in fact, that's where we first saw a bug, um, New Gods number nine. And every week we would beg him, please let us take this home and eat. He's like, no. <laughs> and finally, he, he, uh, Lee convinced him to uh, let us take it. And so when Lee and I were able to do our uh, bug project, that was like a childhood dream come true. Um, but, but my, in fact, uh, I should have grabbed it. One of the, what my earliest clear memory was waking up in a hospital and the hospital bed was covered with comic books. Turns out my brother had knocked me off a card table and I landed on my head and got a concussion and feeling a bit guilty and also selfish, talked to mom and dad into buying a bunch of comic books. And so they, they were all there blanketed when uh, when I woke up. And uh, he was able to remember some of the actual issues. And I repurchased a Superman that's on my spinner rack in my studio over there. Uh, I don't have the number to, uh, but I, I'm able to completely uh, know exactly when that happened. And this would be like mid 60s, mid late 60s. That is a great origin story for a cartoonist. <laughs> You know, knock, <laughs> knocked out and wake up with comics everywhere. <laughs> this video is brought to you by the comics that we make. Ed Piscor's Switchblade Shorties is now being serialized on all of our social media every single day. You can see a sample of some of the upcoming storylines here. You can also pick up Hip Hop Family Tree, the Omnibus, collecting all four volumes of the Hip Hop Family Tree in one handsome hardcover edition, along with 140 extra pages, including lots more art, comics, and notes. Red Room, Crypto Killers, the third volume in the Red Room series will be coming out in January, but you can read the Red Room series in any order. These are all self-contained stories. Oops, I forgot. You're not supposed to flip through this one on YouTube. <laughs> X-Men Grand Design, the trilogy trade paperback is now available collecting all three seasons of the X-Men Grand Design story in one handsome volume. My latest comics, Street Angel, Princess of Poverty, and Deadliest Girl Alive, collect all of my Street Angel comics in two handsome books from Image Comics. That is The Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard. I've also been self-publishing some comics and zines lately. True Crime Funnies, three nonfiction stories, BW Zine celebrating the black and white explosion, and the 1986 zine celebrating the greatest year in comics history. You can get those on jimrug.com or patreon.com slash jimrug. And my Hulk Grand Design. This collection, the Treasury Oversized Edition, one of my proudest books, available now in very limited quantities as it is out of print. But a new collection of trade paperback of Hulk Grand Design will be available in May this year from Marvel, so start pre-ordering that one now. And now back to our video. But Dad was a, uh, Dad was a psychologist. In fact, Ken Kesey, who wrote One Floor of the Cuckoo's Nest, was his orderly. And um, he was a frustrated artist and uh I don't know how frustrated he was, but he always kept art supplies everywhere. Uh, even had a big drafting table, and uh, so we always had paper and and color pencils, and um, so we were constantly. And I were always laying on our stomachs on the floor, drawing stuff and making our own comics. And it's what we do when we would every summer we'd do a loop through all the relatives, which would take us up through the Rocky Mountains and and through Salt Lake City and past Park City and. Um, and so that was Lee and I uh, entertaining ourselves. And, um, you know, it would be the whole, you'd have the paper, you'd fold it in half and, and make your panels and fill them in and, or just draw, or just create characters. And so we did that all the time. And that, that, was, that was my childhood and it, and it was always my escape. In fact, my whole life is, uh, is about escape. I'm just escaping reality at every turn, and, and that's what keeps me going. That's why I'm as prolific as I am, because it's my happy place. It's it's what lights me up. It's what I love the idea of creating something today that didn't exist yesterday, and it keeps me going. It's your, uh, talking about rock and roll, man, that Red Rocket 7 comic was a revelation to me when it came out, and that was a that's a big influence on, on my hip-hop family tree series because I at that time I was like is it even legal to be drawing you know <laughs> these these guys uh, you know David Bowie can you do that is that is that possible but uh, you did a loop through through Pittsburgh when we were kids when we were younger uh, teenagers I guess and uh, I got some great inking advice from you man uh, it was from me 
Yes, sir. I went up to your table and uh, the exact situation was uh, I got to see Paige's originals. It was like my first artist edition experience, right? Because like, you know, you go to the convention and there'll be those small cons where there might be some guys there, but they're maybe kind of hacky or just like you don't care about their work that much, but it's cool to see originals. But like going to your table, you were selling it in one of those Itoya folder things. It was the complete, you're trying to sell the complete issue four of Mad Men with the, uh, the sort of the boat on the cover using like either color pencil or like coquille board for the, for the, the, the was it coquille? It was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, you had that whole issue and I was like, I knew that comic well, and I got to see the originals to a comic I cared about and I had submissions. Like, so I, so I was like showing you my portfolio and you were like, you're inking with a synthetic brush. <laughs> you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta get a, a Raphael. You gotta go get a, a series seven Windsor Newton. And I'm like taking notes and this is before the internet, man. So like you ain't like i didn't know about any art stores but like pat Catan's, and the best brush they had was like a ten dollar synthetic nothing brush I mean, it was years before i was able to get one of those man but you gave me some good instruction it was i it got was, that instruction from charles burns he was the one that turned me on to windsor uh windsor newton series seven he worked with a three which i found too big and also too expensive because it would be frustrating because uh if you get a bad brush it still costs the same but if it's, it, they can split. And then it was, I, I think it was Bill Stout who said, well, when you go into the store, ask him if you can dip it in water and snap it on your arm. And if it splits, don't buy it. Um, and, uh, and I stuck with the, I think I mostly worked with a one, a Series 7 one. But then uh, a few years ago, Joe Quinones gave me one of these uh, uh, Japanese, um, cartridge not car it's like you screw in the ink thing right the ink was so black and so rich because the ink i'd been using just kept getting worse and worse like uh Gin's black magic uh used to be rich and then it became kind of watery and so i'd have to mix it with uh, speedball super black or something and then it would become like tar right and then joe quinones was like here take this and um it and it's ironically a synthetic brush but um at by this point i developed enough skill that i could pretty much make anything work and uh used it just for fun and then um started using it entirely and now it's my favorite brush i just love the heck out of it it's so cool man. Well, and, I, and then also darwin cook turned me on to uh Faber Castell pit pens. So for really teeny, teeny, teeny little technical details, I'll use like an extra fine one of those. But that that's pretty much my whole linking uh, inking palette toolbox. Mike, I'm glad you uh, you bring up some tools because you know, like thinking about your career, I, f I found your stuff in the early '90s. I think you were doing Madman at Tundra. I think I mail ordered it through a catalog. I might have ordered some Charles Burns at the same time, um, but you were doing brush, you know, as a as a primary inking tool at a time when like all the image guys, you know, the pen nib and, and the cross hatching was kind of the dominant visual for successful American comics, and you were doing a brush at a time when it might not have been the most popular. What led you in that direction? Was there somebody, an influence, or how, how do you how do you develop that style that is yours whenever it seemed like the popular trends were different it's what appealed to me um first of all all the most of the greats like uh ink with a brush you look you know i i'm constantly going back to uh 60s 70s marvel dc uh my favorite artists and artists like bruno premiani or um but c contemporaries like uh dan klaus um charles burns um, Seth, uh, they, these are, these are guys that were, uh, Paul Ravoche. These are guys that had these beautiful brush lines. And, and I think it was Charles Burns who said with the brush, you can go from the thinnest line to the thickest line in one stroke. 
So you have this incredible control that you don't have with a pen. And a pen is uh, very stiff. Um, in fact, uh, just off the top of my head, the only hero, lifelong hero, who would use markers or pens would be Alex Toth. And to his detriment, there's so much Alex Toth artwork that is faded and just gone That's because true. he uses crappy markers. And, um, and he turned me on to these markers. It happened to my stuff. In fact, I've told people that if, if this has happened to you and I'm at a show, bring me the art. I will ink it right then and there. I will read <laughs> it if, if your art has faded because, yeah, it's uh, crushing. But I, uh, the worst one was I did a book called uh, Vertical, Vertical that was you opened it mm -hmm. like this. And um, but I didn't ink that. Philip Bond did. And he fell victim to one of those crappy pens. And so I, I, I owned, I kept a couple of the spreads and they have faded and it's like never again. Yeah. It's, and so the, again, this Japanese, uh, brush pen that I'm using now, it's perfect. The, the ink is so black and smooth. It's, I just love the heck out of it. You, you bring up Toth, and it gets me thinking about those great uh, Madman um, trading cards, right? Where you get all these luminaries to, to, to draw your character. Speaking of a luminary, <laughs> <laughs> recognize that, Jim? <laughs> Look at that thing, man. Jimmy, you drew that for, uh, I did, for yeah, the man? Yeah. I did, yeah. I need to get something from you, Ed. We'll talk, man. I'm very expensive. Very expensive. <laughs> but uh, Mike, the the question that 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 I have, uh, it's 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 less of a question, and uh, I'm more curious about uh, if you might have a couple of stories to tell about about these various guys. Anything anything spring to mind? Uh, was Frazetta, Frazetta a cool guy? Alex Toth did one. Man, was he a cantankerous guy? As, as well, we, Alex we Toth did a, a couple. Here's, I just got to show this in color because Jim went to town on the colors too, uh, putting in these different backgrounds, like uh, the different lines and stuff. Yeah, that's it's, awesome. <laughs> this is the 20th anniversary special that collected everything up to then. There, there's like, I, I've, I, one of the luckiest, I wouldn't say smartest things I ever did, but um, just when we would early, the first 10 years of our career, my career, then Laura, when she was able to start coloring full time, we did every show. We ex accepted every invitation, and um, back in the uh, '90s, you would go to a show, and there would be maybe six to twelve guests. The show organizer would take all the guests out to dinner. You'd hang out. Over time, the shows got bigger, and you got spread out, and these friends and peers that you've developed these strong relationships with became it became more and more of a challenge to get together and spend time together and so we stopped we did fewer and fewer shows but early on we just made these valuable relationships that have lasted and um like i'll i'll see somebody like mark schultz and it's like it's like we've never been apart you know they, these friendships go very deep and uh, matt wagner was the first uh person i really bonded with um he was in living in san jose my first publisher was slave labor graphics which is out of san jose and i was a tv reporter in germany at the time i had to get sent all over europe covering human interest stories and um uh he had seen Dan Vero had showed him my first work, which <laughs> I don't know wh why Matt was impressed at all <laughs> with this early stuff, but he sent me a mage postcard. And we're like, hey, I saw your stuff. Uh, I like it. Here's my phone number. And I was like, wow. And so I called him and uh, and we stayed in touch. We fell through this whole Kamiko debacle, which I won't go into, but it bonded us there. And then his sister-in-law, Dana Schutz, became the editor-in-chief at Dark Horse in Portland. 
And we moved back to the States in January of 1990 for me to uh, attempt a full-time comic book career. And thanks to Laura, I was able to keep doing it even when things got got tight. But um, of course we fell in with the Dark Horse crowd and then Matt moved to Portland and uh, and then uh, Bob Shre Shrek, his uh, brother-in-law at the time, uh, became my editor. He went from marketing director to want wanting to be an editor. And Frank Miller and I were his first full-time editing jobs. So Frank and I had Bob Shrek to ourselves. And so by the time uh, Dark Horse picked up Madman Comics, I had a full-time editor slash marketing director and and that i i completely i mean along the way the people like ann egan and kevin eastman really did wonderful things like ann egan got alan moore to to uh, blurb madman early on stuff like that just luck 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 right place right time and um and so i and i say this only because i see so many talented people out there so many artists that are just amazing yet either they don't have the right connections the right way about uh there could be a work ethic thing could be interest some people will come in explode and but then they're they're, they're then they burn out or they're, maybe they don't love comic books that much and so they just kind of go away um i can't imagine doing anything else in fact i've tried i've played in the movie business for a little bit, uh, did a, uh, my band, The Gears, done a couple of albums, but there's nothing that I enjoy more than being in my happy place, making comic books. And so that's why I stick to it. But, but with, again, just early on, all of these, and because of Dark Horse, Mike Richardson would constantly have a flow of people coming in. So we would, uh, you know, Art Adams and Mike Mignola would come up and, um, uh, on and on, It'd just always be all of there would always be these events where you get to hang out. Dave Stevens was always coming up. Um, Bill Stout, Al Williamson, you know, um, it, it was uh, these. And then it was Frank Miller who introduced me to Frank Frazetta. So two of the greatest Franks ever. <laughs> and and uh, so when I met Frazetta, uh, you know, I, I can get pretty shy, but here was my chance. And so Mr. Frazetta or <laughs> Frank, um, would you do one of these pieces for me? And, and Frank Miller's right there saying, I did one Frank. And so was, he's like, okay. So next thing I know, I have a Frank Frazetta madman. And with uh, Alex Toth uh, back in the day, um, Scott Dunbeer was a art dealer. He's, you know, he's responsible for these beautiful artist editions. But back in the day, he was the guy that that had the best. It was him and Albert Moy, who always had the best original art and would make the best trades and whatnot. And Scott was very supportive of my work, and uh, he knew I was a big fan of Alex Toth and was like, "Oh, here's his address and phone number." And so, wow. And so again, I just uh, cautioned to the wind, threw uh, some of my stuff in the mail to Alex, and um, then um waited a few days and then called him up and he answered the phone and uh was introduced myself and says yeah i was just looking at it i, I really like this and i love this whole reverse silhouette you got going with this madman character and and so i was like oh well man um i we're doing uh uh I, I, we, we always on the back cover have a different artist we're also doing a card set and so I was hoping you could do a piece for me. It's like, oh, I got one in the one's already in the mail. So he had already responded. And he says, oh, and, and you're doing a, a, a card set, too? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I'll do another one for you. And and then then he started talking about, hey, you live in Oregon, right? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, there was this certain brand of dried apricots that he liked or something. <laughs> and um, and so he he. he at this point, he was kind of becoming, uh, uh, what's it called when you don't leave your house? <laughs> yeah, agor agoraphobic. Yeah, and um, so he had friends, like, kind of uh, send him things or go out and get his groceries and whatnot. And um, so I would, uh, he started mentoring me and would um, 
go through all of my work, give me critiques of everything. And in, and what he asked me to do was send him these packages of peanuts and apricots. He wanted me to send him cigarettes, but he had this horrible cough. And I was like, I draw the line there, Alex. There's no way I'm going to contribute to your cough. And so he was cool with that. And, um, and that went on for quite a while where I would send him a package with the, the each time a new book would come out and he would, uh, you know, talk it out with me and it'd be phone calls and, and, uh, um, his wonderful letters and, uh, with the little doodles and whatnot. And, uh, one time we even, we were in LA and we, uh, went to his house, which is this really cool neighborhood by the Hollywood bowl where it's been in movies where you'll see these outdoor elevators on the, this hilltop and all the uh, parking is down on this street. All the garages are in a row. And then you either take a path or this elevator up to these different homes, very unique neighborhood. And his house was just stacked with newspaper piles and, and stuff. And when he answered the door, he was like uh, shirtless and big barreled, chested dude and and um he was always so kind and affectionate towards us and um and as legend has it he always cuts people off and i i got that experience too where he just cut us off that's and interesting that we, we, we've heard a version of that story from several people i'm a huge alex we're both huge alex toth fans so whenever we come in contact with somebody that has some personal experience you know we we try to pull out a story or two but that cutoff is something that comes up with, you know, almost everybody we've talked to who has had relationships with him and yeah. for whatever reason, they, they all seem to end that way. Yeah. It, uh, when it happened to me, I was devastated and I hadn't heard any of the other stories at that point. And what had happened was um, I would have a FedEx box open to because I would over time as I was making a book, fill it with his stuff, the different treats and whatnot that he liked. Well, um, when I didn't get the phone call after the, this last package, I was like, huh? So I called him up and, and he was pissed. He was just angry. And um, I was like, what's wrong? He was like, I'm not some charity case. And I don't think that's funny or something like that. And I was like, what are you talking about? What was with the loose change? And you know, this box was open and I had little kids running around. And I guess there were some pe pennies and nickels in there or something. And he took offense to that. And I, there was no talking him down. It, it, he was just, it just made him angry. And, and I don't know if he had caller ID, but he never answered the phone after that. And um, yeah, that was it. And then um, a documentary came out on him. I think I'd, I'd talked to Mark Chirello or, or somebody I'd heard. Oh yeah. He'll, uh, and and to also I I had heard what a crank he was even as I was friends with him right and about him getting in fights at shows and throwing people in swimming pools and stuff like that and you know all kinds of uh, blow ups that he'd had and so when people would tell me these stories I'd go well, that's not the Alex I know and um, and so then after this had happened to me I I, I think uh, I'd been working or hanging out with Mark Chiarello and he was super close with Alex and had similar had a similar experience. But then a documentary came out with a Space Ghost uh, DVD set and it was talking head after talking head <laughs> about, yep, Alex cut me off here, Alex cut me off here and was like, okay. Then I, at that point it felt like I was part of a club or something and, and it, <laughs> it eased the pain. Here's here's a famous story in in, in comics. Uh, Kevin Eastman is like, you know, I'm gonna have another uh, publishing wing. We got our Mirage Studios thing over here. I'm gonna do Tundra over there. I'm gonna go to San Diego Comic Con and we'll start light. I'm gonna buy like five books this first year. Maybe we'll increase it to like 15 books a year is what I'll put out. Goes to San Diego Comic Con, comes back with like seventy five books. Were you one of those books? Was Batman <laughs> one of those books from of that seventy five? Not initially. Um, my experience uh, uh, was maybe 
I don't know. <laughs> what, did you but, make the deal with San Diego? Because like I think that would probably no, tell the tale. No, it, w- it was actually Oakland, um, which later became uh, it was WonderCon, which was at uh, Oakland, and then San Francisco. I think it's in LA now. But um, I had been doing graphic music, graphic music, which was my Love and Rockets inspired um, self anthology umbrella title, where I could tell any story I wanted in in this, uh, but. It, it wasn't selling, um, not to where I could make a living. And Laura was managing a jewelry store and she was the breadwinner at this point, but she allowed me to keep going. And uh, um, when my kids started going to school, our two oldest boys, um, they they would tell their friends, my dad makes comic books. And uh, before it was easy easier because I was in broadcasting, but my dad's on TV. And now it was like, I had these comic books that I didn't feel comfortable having his, my kid's friend see. It was very esoteric. And um, one, one book, because of its cover, was actually banned in Canada. Um, Gra- Graphique Music Number no. 2. They uh, got stopped at the border or something. But uh, had an axe murder on the cover. <laughs> <laughs> but with this, I then thought, well, what would my kids like that I would like to do? And at the time, my favorite character was Frank Einstein. And I thought, well, I'll put a costume on him and turn him into a, an adventurer. I'll just send him on adventures and just tap into all the stuff I loved as a kid with flying saucers and robots and aliens and all this stuff. And so, um, but it, but when I started it out, I was a big fan of uh, the spirit, you know, Will Eisner. So I thought, well, I'll call him the spook. And I was I never thought of any negative aspect to that title at the time um and uh i made glow in the dark t-shirts and i made a dummy book uh so it looked like a comic in, in a uh you know a bag and board and and it was on the 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 shirt was on a frankenstein foam core mannequin and uh in fact early on we made lots of shirts and those kind of uh paid the bills before the they sell better than the comics and i had a glow in the dark spook t-shirt and it says spook number one the comic book spook number one and greg Basden was kevin eastman's editor-in-chief at the time and he was knocked out by it uh then uh was able to meet with him and uh kevin and it happened right there i was like we'll do this and then um somebody had told me what uh the page rates kevin was giving and so i thought because i'd never known what a page rate i hadn't had a page rate at this point in fact i i had just got my first page rate with dark horse which was 85 dollars a page for tales of ordinary madness which was also the first book i inked with a brush and this is after my conversation with charles burns prior to that i didn't know any i hadn't a clue what i should be inking with Dead Air, my first published work, was inked with the rapidograph. And I was inking it on um, 11 by 17 copy paper, like what would come out of a Xerox machine. So with the rapidograph, it was just tore up. <laughs> and so I was just flailing. And then the, the brush was a revelation. And the page rate was like, oh, wow, OK. But then I'd heard that Kevin was much more generous than that. So when they asked me for my page rate, I just made up a ridiculous number and um, he said yes. And uh, so all of a sudden we were, we were flowing, you know, it was like, I, it was three 48 page issues and um, square bound. And um, I'd seen Dave McKean's cages. And so I learned about that sec- second color because they, uh, I did want to do full color. And we tried to do that with graphic music with this gray line process, which was a nightmare. And you'll you'll see there there are these uh, there's this library collection that Dark Horse has been putting out, collecting all well all of my creator own work. And um, so it has Dead Air in color for the first time, and uh, the graphic music stuff, which was in that was in color, was scanned from the pages. So you'll just see how awful that was. And Laura actually cried when we got her got her copies in the mail. <laughs> um, but 
you know, just constantly powering on. And, and uh, um, a couple years later or so, there was an interview in the Comics Journal with Kevin Eastman. And I, I think it was Gary Groth who like, like, what the hell are you paying Mike Allred that much for? Like, you know, <laughs> like he, he knew what the page rate was and, 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 and was uh, upset about it. And I was the example he used for somebody <laughs> being paid. So that, that wasn't fun, but um, any, anyway, it, it is what it is. I feel like it's one of the high points that came out of Tundra. You know, when, when you think of the people who actually used the money and made the books. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. Like, the, the book came out. He made good on it. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about right place, right time, right circumstances. That's what happened. Um, I, when I got the deal, that's all I, I, I dove in. And all of a sudden they're getting, again, these are 40 page issues. I think I did all three issues in like two and a half months. So they got, it was coming in and they had this huge marketing budget and no books to market because they weren't being completed. And so they just, uh, just threw in and they invested in me. Uh, I'll, be forever grateful and it and it it launched kevin got tired of publishing um and uh bob shrek who i'd become friends with moving to dark horse tells mike richardson hey madman is a free agent now and they took it in and took it from here to here just one wonderful lucky thing after another but um the one thing i will take full credit for is um, a work ethic because I had previously been doing a job I did not love, but was forced to work really hard. And I thought, well, if I work that hard with something I love, maybe there'll be some positive results. And that's, that's what I've gone off of ever since. I wonder if there's any, <laughs> I like, I, I want to see some, some video where you're, where you're like a, a talking head, like news guy in in Germany, you know, putting microphones in front of people's faces and stuff. I want to see what that looks like. Is is huh. it, is any of that on YouTube or anything? We could we could find that somewhere. If it is, I've never seen it. Um, it it was for uh, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, and so it was AFRTS. And I there was a magazine show. Laura, do you remember the name of the magazine show? Uh, we can't remember what it was called, but um, my last story was uh, uh, the, uh, covering the fall of the Berlin Wall. Wow. And, um, it's first grade, baby. Yeah, interviewing uh, East German refugees. And and then this uh, the end of 1989, um, we were up uh, on a cliff by Langstuhl Castle, New Year's, and fireworks going off from ar around us and down in the village of Lonstuhl, which is next to Ramstein, which is close to Kaiserslautern. Um, and then Frankfurt would be the next big city from there. But from every corner down below us, we're seeing fireworks go up. That was the most optimistic time I've ever experienced in my life. It just felt like the whole world was coming together. You know, it was, uh, there was no war, no major war was going on. Um, and it, it just felt like, you know, peace was coming and, and uh, all of these people were um, coming from the east and with open arms with jobs for them and people trying to help them. There wasn't any fear of, you know, East German immigrants or anything, not at that time. Um, but it was a powerful way to end my broadcasting career because part of that, I was, I'd mostly cover stories on a youth center in Athens or a a woman who built uh, scale castles uh, as a hobby, you know, um, or somebody got some some virtual uh, golfing thing that they wanted to show off. So they would fly our crew over there and we'd do a story on it. So uh, when when the, the wall started coming down, um, yeah, that that was that was huge. And uh, I had actually taken pieces of the wall and um, had them stacked up. So when we moved, they, they had people who would pack our stuff and move us. And um, I had sent one piece of the wall, which had paint on it, 
uh, to Matt Wagner. And I had all these other pieces that were, I just set off to the side. And then um, uh, when we, um, when we asked the movers, where, where are the rocks? They were like, oh, no, no. And like, we threw them away. And like, what? And they're like, uh, um, Blanken, what's, as, they were like, asbestos. <laughs> oh, geez. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Man, that's amazing. Makes me think of Pat Boyette. He's like the only other cartoonist I can think of that went from television to making comics. <laughs> but Matt says he still has that, that piece. But uh, hopefully it's it's not as best. <laughs> Got to keep that submerged underwater. <laughs> Mike, well, I'm... Speak, speaking of scale uh, castles, there's my bat cape that I built. <laughs> That's awesome, man. Do you, do you see the you see the Batmobile? Yes. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Jerry the King Lawler owns the original. <laughs> the original bat cave? Batmobile. Oh. <laughs> oh, the one that you can drive. Yes. Yeah, the real car. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, I actually sat in one with uh, Adam West. That's cool. Now, the, talk about if, if, if I could throw modesty to the wind, that's my, for my <laughs> life, that's the biggest brag for me, um, being Adam West's official cover artist. That was beyond, beyond. And, and first meeting him uh, and uh, in person and him introducing me to Julie Newmar and 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 the the Batmobile and everything. It was like I was I was six years old all over again and just like in heaven. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, anyway, I just love having been able to do all those Batman sixty six books. And that all started with Darwin Cook, by the way. Um, he he was uh, my best buddy. He he actually came and uh, stayed with us. Um, we had uh, a little cabin on, um, there's uh, 10 mile lakes on the Oregon coast. Um, and there, it's the largest stretch of coastal dunes. Um, and there's a creek that you can kayak through the dunes. And when you're in there, you, it looks like Planet of the Apes or something. There's no sign of civilization anywhere. And so uh, this little cabin um, that we took Darwin out to when we first got it, there was nothing really to do there other than just play games and uh, draw. And so we sat on the floor and uh, would draw and slide drawings across to each other on this little coffee table. And so I would ink Darwin's drawing and he would ink mine. And I drew an Adam West Batman. And, um, and so I slide over him and was like, how did you do this? So I was like, uh, you do this from memory? And it was like, he's in my blood. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, Darwin inked it beautifully. And uh, so when years later, when um, the DC Solo series happened, um, I decided to do an Adam West Batman doing the Batusi on the cover and uh, used the, the head I, I, that uh, was the ultimate result of Darwin inking it. So I, I made sure it looked like it would it looked exactly like the way he inked it, the head, and did the figure at that point. Um, the head, by the way, became showed up on the back cover, but uh, on the cover, right, they solicited it, and when it was about to go to press, uh, uh, Trella was the uh, editor, called me up and said, we can't use it, not like, why, and he said, well, um, legal says it looks too much like Adam West. And I was like, well, yeah. <laughs> um, and well, we don't have the, his likeness rights. And my response was, well, get them. And um, it was too late for then, but I, so I redo the cover as uh, with uh, Wonder Girl doing the Batusi. And then soon after that, they did get the rights, asked me to do the Batman 66 series. I think I was doing Silver Surfer at the time or maybe I was doing FF with Matt Fraction, but I couldn't do do it, but I did say I would do all the covers, which I then did, and also did two full issues that my brother Lee wrote. So that, again, childhood dreams coming true. But um, by the time, oh, 
So, but the solicitation had gone out. So people had seen the cover and it had, had a little viral uh, energy. So when I met Adam West in New York at a New York Comic Con, um, it wasn't New York Comic Con, but it was a New York show. And um, I was able to say, uh, I actually drew you and, and oh yeah. So uh, there, it, it had that n nice little connection. And then the series soon after happened after that. So, uh, but he was familiar with the DC solo art. And um, uh, so when the DC solo collection came together, the, the omnibus, uh, Chirello put my original Batman on the cover in the end papers, he's all over that omnibus. Because by that point, they had, they had the likeness rights. So a little happy ending with that. Can we talk about Mark Chiarello for a minute? He's a guy who, uh, based on the, I'd never, I've never met him, but based on the projects that he's associated with, I feel like that's a really impressive uh, resume that he's put together. Very creative, I don't know, editor, art director. What can you tell us about Mark Chiarello and how he put together some of these projects? Because he also did Wednesday Comics, which you had a strip yeah. in. Um, what was he like to work with, and and how did how did he function within like a DC corporate office? Nobody better. Uh, he, all of his ideas were great. In fact, the only significant stuff I did in the DC universe was always with Mark. Um, the the only DC stuff I was allowed to do or was re ever really offered was um, uh, Vertigo, which was a whole other entity. So I was I was at the very beginning of Vertigo, and Shelley Bond, who was uh, and Karen Berger, Shelley was my first editor ever, with uh, Kamiko, right. the, the Jaguar Stories series, which never came out. That Steve Siegel and I co-created, and that was my in. That's how I was able to quit broadcasting, because um, I was going to get a page rate, and it was a twelve issue series that w warranted the roll of the dice and go back to the States and try to do comics full time. And then as soon as that happened, Kamiko went chapter 11 and we were, I burned my bridges. And so here we were. And, uh, but again, um, Matt Wagner turned uh, Neil Gaiman on to my stuff. So then uh, Neil asked me to do Sandman. It was always those things. So kids be nice, be positive and uh get out there show your stuff uh, just you know love what you do don't let anything stump on your dreams and just get it in front of as many faces as possible and you never know what will result there but but it's because of people like matt wagner and and darwin cook and uh you know everybody i've named that uh it's it's the kindness and enthusiasm of your peers that keeps these doors open, you know, and, and gives you all these different opportunities. So, um, but with Chirello, he had th these projects and thankfully would approach me and they were always fun. Some of them didn't fly, but the ones that did really flew. Uh, Wednesday Comics, what a kick. And that, that um, working with Neil for the third time with me on that, we did a metamorpho strip. And then uh, DC Solo, why isn't DC Solo a regular thing? It's genius. I agree. A, a, a comic where an artist gets to decide the content. And then there's so many artists out there that I would love to see let loose on a whole DC book like that. It's when he left DC, it was like, it was crushing, crushing. Yeah, his name would come up with so much stuff of Batman Black and White. Yes. It showed up yeah. in, and then yes. M M Mignola collaborations over at Marvel. Did those Wolverine covers himself, if you remember? Like, dude, do that chop, see what he could draw his ass off too. Oh, yeah. He was DC's MVP, as far as I'm concerned. The, the, every project he came up with was something to get excited about. And the, and the talent that he would bring in was always something to get excited about. Yeah, it was, it's a huge loss. I feel like you look at like Marvel DC output and his books really do stand out as being some of the most creative concepts. And like you say, I, I feel like all of those concepts could still be going. Why couldn't there be a Wednesday comics as a, you know, having a broadsheet that would run forever 
with uh, with the big iconic characters. But it's, um, oh, it's a no brainer. It's it, it's a no brainer. Just sure. Some are going to be weirder than others and less commercial than others. But you're always going to get this grab bag. And and who's not going to want to see what what kind of weirdness somebody's going to do when they're just let loose in the DC universe? <laughs> you know who doesn't want to see it is like the brass upstairs. <laughs> yeah, heaven forbid. Well, the happy ending on that is I, I now I am I, I did Superman Space Age last year. I'm doing Batman Dark Age now, and I have a wonderful relationship with DC now and having a great time with them. And my my editor Brittany is fantastic. I love working with Mark Russell. He's a fellow Oregonian. So yeah. I, life is good. Mike, I want to ask you a little bit about process because I just really don't know it. And you're one of the few writer artists I know who work with writers. You know, a lot of times once a once a cartoonist kind of becomes full-time writing artist, they tend to work on their own. Uh, you've gone back and forth. What's your writing process like? Do you write scripts? Yeah. I start with an outline. In fact, uh, I've got a Madman outline, which would take me three lifetimes to to finish, and especially since the collaborations always rise to the top because I'm dealing with other people's schedules. So my uh, creator-owned personal work is is uh, spare time only at this point. But uh, I have an outline, and then I jump in with the script. Of course, it's a really loose script because I don't need to describe the panels because I know what they're going to be. And um, and so it might be like page two, this happens, page three, this happens, page four, this happens. And um, and then uh, some some scenes are dialogue driven. So some of my scripts might have a lot of back and forth between characters. And um, some might uh, like I did a silent issue where uh, which was all just visual cues throughout the script. But yeah, I work from a script. And with any script, my own script or uh, uh, another uh, writer's script, right on the script, I draw little uh, thumbnails, little tiny, um, just little quickie compositions. So close up or, you know, I'll just, so I, I immediately can go through a script and, and remember what my, and I, and I will do it on, my, on the first read. And because I, I want my first impression to be there and then when I uh, go to uh, 11 by 17 and I revisit it, um, sometimes I'll erase it and like, no, 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 it'll work better like this. And so on the, um, but almost always will then just immediately go uh, to full size, um, right to the bristle board. And then, um, yeah, draw it, Laura scans it, I ink it. Oh, um, we also came up with a process which is unique to us because my colorist lives with me, um, I will ink the line art and let's. <clears throat> this is exciting, Jimmy. Okay, so um, okay, this this will be a good example. Um, so here's a here's a Batman page. Now that's just that's just line art. And um, an, an elevator door has opened, and there's security guards in there who don't want him there. Um, now, so Laura has scanned this, and now um, I will do tones um, with uh, ink wash or graphite. You know, I'll pencil some tones in there, smear it around, get whatever I want. Then Laura scans it again, and then she's able to turn all those tones into any color that she wants, but they're separate from the line art. So uh, we have all, uh, Laura has all these different um, options. Um, this, you'll see, this doesn't have as much tone as some, but you can see some of the. Yeah, that's yeah. sweet, man. Like, like the, the shadow under the space here, that kind of thing. So by doing this, I get to, I get to control the modeling. And um, I had a bad experience with uh, a colorist once where they just modeled the crap out of it, but it, none of the planes of the face were the way I would have sculpted it. So it was like, nah, um, overdone. And, and uh, so it was kind of a never again kind of thing. You're very and lucky. This, 
to have a very good colorist <laughs> that you live with. Oh. Because I no, feel I, like computer I, coloring, you know, there was so many, there's such a learning curve that's still going on in a lot of cases. So to be able to work closely with a colorist, I think it's helped your art really look great through a period where a lot of color art has not looked great. Especially she was coloring that stuff during that bleeding edge period when everybody was playing with those radial blurs and stuff. And uh, what's oh, that? Yeah. Keep it simple, stupid, that yes. type of stuff, man. Well, Pick real good also, flat colors. Yeah, we're, again, we're, we always, some people refer to my stuff as retro or uh, I, I, I like to think of it as timeless or classic and Laura and I both are big fans of uh, classic looking stuff and um, uh, I, uh, and, and also when she was first uh, starting out she was looking at uh, uh, Daniel Torres and uh, Dan Klaus so Dan Klaus's uh, first color stuff in 8-Ball it would always be flat, you know, just flat classic colors. And and we're also, you know, uh, fans of pop art. In fact, these paintings, these are gonna be uh, at the, uh, they're gonna be auctioned at the Original Art Expo in um, Orlando at the end of the month, the 26, 27, 28, something like that. But these are, this is me getting pop art back from the Roy Lichtensteins of the world. Yeah, that's dope. So for me, it, it's like the the crime of not, a, you know, crediting who you're, you're getting your stuff from. So I'm I'm swiping from myself. <laughs> what media are those, Mike? It's acrylic. But I also uh, my daughter in law made me these uh, stencils, which I get the dot patterns from. And so that's, you know, uh, spray. And so, but um, other than the, those kind of uh, airbrushing textures and whatnot, it's, it's just uh, acrylic paint. We also made a stencil with exclamation bolts. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Man, I feel like you could paper the town with that stuff. Yes. Do some oh, guerrilla marketing. I, I haven't even mentioned my shirt. What's the shirt? Know, it's the prisoner. Oh, oh yeah, word. Very nice. See, I would do the hand sign, but I think we'll get kicked out of Portland uh, <laughs> yes. if, 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 if we if we do that. <laughs> Mike, no, I, I, I I saw your episode. In fact, this this is so surreal because I, I I kind of remarked about this with Ed. Like I've I've spent hours and hours with you guys. <laughs> you spent next to no time with me, but um, yeah, it's it's uh, I really dig your show. That your grand design books are just always within reach and and uh, um, love it. But when I saw you do the prisoner one, which by the way, uh, I colored the piece in there. Laura didn't, which you you mentioned, which because it, it was a selfish thing. It was like, no, I'm I'm going to do this, and <laughs> and so I did it. And she was like, yeah, you did all right. So she she <laughs> let it. Down. But um, check this out. Th these one six scale figures are like, a, uh, again, I'm a crazy nerd. And this is where I really nerd out with this stuff. But look at that. It looks just like him. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, I made this bad boy. I sculpted this. This is a one of a kind. It's uh, David Bowie is Thomas Newton from The Man Who Fell to, Fell to Earth. That's incredible, man. Wow. Thanks. And like I said, I built that bat cave. And then the vehicle is from a Danish uh, family. They're, uh, their company is called Jazz Inc. And they, uh, they, they'll do Star Wars vehicles. Like they did a Millennium Falcon cockpit and stuff like that. But yeah. Does it drive you crazy, Laura? Or do you enjoy it too? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just to fan out here about the prisoner because uh, it's a passion of ours. Um, one of our trips to Europe, we we were able to stay in uh, Oakley Court, where they filmed all the a, a lot of the Hammer Horror films and Rocky Horror Picture Show. And so we stayed in the suite. When you watch Rocky Horror and you see Riff Raff up in the tower, we stayed in that room. It's, <laughs> it's a hotel. And then with the, the but with the prisoner, the entire village has been maintained. And you can stay in the cottages. Wow. Uh, it's, it's Port Marion, Wales. And anybody that's a fan of uh, The Prisoner, 
you must go there. It is the most wonderful experience. You can't stay in num uh, the number six uh, cottage because that is the gift shop, gift shop where I bought this. <laughs> 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 and you can get like the, the, the jacket with the white piping and everything. It's just, if you're a fan, it is like, if you're not a fan, <laughs> yeah, it, it is beautiful, but it's just bliss being there. Do they have just a random uh, big white beach balls <laughs> floating around outside or anything like that? Oh, yeah, Rover. I should have brought my Rover in here too, but you can buy a Rover. <laughs> <laughs> These giant inflatable balloons, yeah. No, it's deflated somewhere, but I, I we got the giant rover but i've also got the little one the six scale rover and a light up rover and... but yeah i eat this stuff up that's so funny <laughs> pop culture fiend mike would you do a lot of uh life life drawing because one of the super noteworthy things to me with with madman comics was like the character was never none of the characters were static ever and there would always be just the most subtle twists and turns to the character in every panel there's never a straight on shot never a side view it's always like a little twist a little turn like what was the process for that yeah i, I actually um excelled in in college with the the life classes um we we would Teacher's do pet. <laughs> <laughs> jealous um uh but yeah i we uh i then did so anyway we, yeah we would have uh live models and um um yeah it was uh, always a key thing I, I i like likenesses that's that's why I like with the bowie book and and the book i'm working on now which uh is another music project spare time that i'm a third of the way through uh starts with the B, but not Bowie. Um, and uh, it's, I like nailing a likeness, but at the same time, wanting it to feel uh, alive, not, and not, not, not a cut and paste kind of vibe. So when, when uh, I, I've always appreciated your reaction to my work in that, the, the feeling of the movement and um, that the, those efforts are not going unnoticed. But uh, yeah, the the I even when I was uh, um, out of school, I my dad hooked me up with a uh, adult adult education program and taught head drawing, and so uh, would have classes of people and would uh, teach them how to draw a, a head portrait in person. And uh, so I never taught the figure drawing, but um, but that was always always key in my education. Would you draw that stuff out of your head, or do you keep like Moy Bridges art of motion books near, near the drawing table? Or no, well, I have all these I have all these figures <laughs> to right. play with. Right. <laughs> um, Alex Ross does that a lot too. Um, if you've ever seen any of his, uh, uh, how he will light a figure, right? Stuff, um, but. It, some out of it's it's uh from everywhere it's from all whatever works um with this batman book i needed um there was a sequence with motorcycles and so i uh, went on ebay and got uh one six scale you know and i'm literally turning it around because at one point they get wiped out so i'm like turning it around and and it, it these have really great detail with the engines and whatnot and and, and Frank Miller does that too with his vehicles. He has a lot of cars um, for like Sin City. He used a lot of uh, models for reference. Um, man, I have so much stuff I want to get into and I feel like we've run out of time so quickly, but uh, you, you went to X-Force at a time, I, I guess it was maybe early in Joe Quesada's run that was really interesting. He was bringing in some different artists and stuff. And I remember that time as being like, the fans of X-Force were kind of like, what is this? You know, you're almost yeah. the antithesis of like a Rob Liefeld style. What was that experience like to you? Um, well, again, right place, right time. Um, I had uh, hung out with Joe in Chicago 
uh, we went to uh, art gallery together and spent some one-on-one -on -one time together when he was just a fellow artist. And so then when he got uh, this job at Marvel and keep in mind, Marvel isn't what it is today. It, they were kind of tr trying anything and everything uh, to see, you know, throwing stuff at, against the wall to see what would work. And they, uh, they had, uh, Joe had earned their confidence and uh, so I'd heard that that he was being given carte blanche here and and it just sounded like, wow, this is going to be fun. So I called him up and and well, Joe, it sounds like you're going to have a great party and I'd love to come to your party. And he was like, oh, that's great. Uh, let me let me uh, let me shake things up around here and see uh, wh what uh, everybody think might work for you. And so they threw a bunch of uh, things at me and. Uh, one of the options was X-Force written by Peter Milligan, who I'd done a Shade, the Changing Man short story with, big fan of his. I think he's one of the most underrated writers in the biz. Just a brilliant guy. And so, and, and, and so then Alex, uh, not, uh, Axel? Axel. Axel. Yeah, Axel, Axel Alonzo called me up. And I uh, had Al Alex Ross in my head um, and uh, pitched it to me and, and said, I've already got Peter Milligan. And here's the thing. You get to start from scratch. You get to create your own Marvel mutants and we'll even like give you ownership rights and stuff. And I was like, what does that mean? Well, uh, like, and he said, well, you're going to get benefits and credits to your creations that nobody has gotten up till now. So this is one of the big changes that they were um, offering. And so, well, that sounds fantastic. And so I was all in at that point. And during that phone conversation actually started doodling characters and, um, just designing right on the phone, um, and copied that off. And I think faxed it from Kinko's to, to, to Axel and on that sheet, which is in one of the omnibuses, if not all of the collections is dupe. And so I just drew this floating potato and then with a word balloon wrote dupe. And so then when he got it, he called me back and said, oh, there's some really great ideas here, um, but there's no way this dupe thing's going to work. And I was, oh, I just did that for fun. And then he called me back the next day and says, okay, we're rethinking dupe because I pinned this up in the hallway and everybody's running up and down the hallway yelling dupe. <laughs> <laughs> And so Dupe, Dupe was in at that point. I feel like that may have inspired Groot a little bit in the uh, yeah, dust him off. Of the Galaxy movie. Yeah, dust him off a little bit, man. Yeah, Groot is uh, old Kirby monster character. Yeah, we've been uh, we started a new series on on the on the channel where we're taking a look at uh, we're starting with November sixty one, looking at all the Marvel comics. Earlier okay. today, we just looked at uh, December. Groot is even before that. Yeah. But uh, it it is real fun seeing how they sort of set all these cornerstones, like m moving forward. Which characters do they dust off? You know, Finn Fang Foom, all that kind of stuff. That that's like James Gunn is another guy who just lights me up. He's one of these guys. He's like Chirello in that way, where he's like, here's an idea. And is fortunate enough to have the support to let his ideas fly. And like we met James Gunn way back when, uh, like he had I, one of his very first movies that he'd written um, is a superhero comedy. And I'm blanking on what it's called. Rob Lowe is, is the star. Um, uh, Hayden Church is in it, his yeah, I, brother. I, I just remember Tromeo and Juliet. Right, but but this this is this is uh, it's good. Oh my gosh, I'm blank. I'm, my head is so useless. It starts with an. It's not the Invincibles or the Incredibles. It sounds something like that. Just I I M D B James Gunn. Anyway, um, but he's been a key supporter through our our career. So it's been huge fun watching his success. What's the stuff you've been working on these days, man? Um, right now it's all Batman all the time. And like I said, I've got this other, the exact same format of as uh, as the Bowie book with another musical act, which I'm not allowed to say what it is yet. But yeah, you uh, said it begins with a B. Buster Rhymes, right? No. Yeah, Buster Rhymes. <laughs> this this is a foreign edition of 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 the Bowie book. Um, 
I think this has been in uh, in more languages than anything I've ever done. Yeah, it makes it, sense. This, this so happy that this did as well as it did. I'm obviously a huge Bowie fan, but um, I'm well, sure yeah, Shelley we, Bond is too, man. Yes. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> shoot. yeah. We we glam rock out every time we're together. Yeah, just like Roxy Music, T Rex, Mott the Hoople. Yeah, it's a. It, we just go on and on. We love all that stuff. Jim, you got anything? I, I I have one more thing I'd like to get crossed off my list, and that is about uh, you start self publishing around two thousand with like Atomics. This is several years into your into your career. You've worked for Marvel and DC and Dark Horse. Why self publish then? Oh, easy answer. Uh, Bob Shrek was my go to guy at um, Dark Horse. And um, and then his assistant became my editor, Jamie Rich, who probably has been my editor on more of my creator own stuff than anybody else. And he he and I he was uh, my go to guy with Red Rocket Seven. Then he so Bob Shrek leaves and forms Oni Press with Joe Nosmack. Then Jamie leaves and joins Oni. And so I had these guys explaining to me. Um, how easy self-publishing is and that you just need to do this 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 you just fill these blocks and and so i was like okay well i'll give it a go because i had a meeting with mike richardson and red rocket seven even though it, it, it in retrospect it, uh, it has a fine reputation but it, it the comic shops had no idea what to do with this square book we'd be like hey point of purchase keep it on the keep it by the cash register but um, it didn't do as well as uh, Dark Horse would have liked. So when I was talking about doing the Atomics, Mike was just, oh, can we just do more Madman for for now? And so I thought, well, I'll do both then. And so I did Madman and the Atomics at the same time. Um, and uh, But with the Atomics, it was like, let's self-publish this. So we did our homework. And with uh, Bob and Jamie's and Joe's uh, advice and tutelage, um, we formed AAA Pop and went to town on it. And I think we stayed monthly for the first year or close to, but realized, you know what? Uh, it's not that difficult to publish, but it is very difficult to publish, do all of the business and draw and write. And, and then write as... I was about to, to like call, call it. I was wrapping it up. That's when uh, I got with Joe, and we and I and we started doing X Force. So timed out there. But yeah, we it, it was something that uh, I would do again if I had the time. Uh, and it, time is the thing. There's just no. There's no time. Like I'm, there's so many things I want to get done. And uh, um, so when, when like with the Batman book, you have a, you have set deadlines. You, you, I've got commitments with my publisher, my editor, my co-creator. And so that's got to take priority over any, um, any of my selfish creator home project. <laughs> Mike, it's such a pleasure to talk to you, man. Thanks so much for, for coming on by. Uh, if, if you ever uh, are interested in, in, in joining us again, I would love to do it again. It would be awesome to sit with you and Laura and maybe unpack one of your or big your head and say hi. Yes, please. One of the best <laughs> colorists in comics. <laughs> She's so shy. Oh, geez. <laughs> this is a treat. I've really, I've, I've wanted to do this for so long and, and as you know, I'm just getting up and running today was such a challenge, but we made it and I'm so happy we did. I love you guys. There's there's more to talk about for sure. I see Jimmy's list is super big. I have like a million more things. So so if we can make it happen again, maybe time, time it to when you have like a strategic project coming out that we could help signal boost or something. But let's let's get some more on the record in the future. And you need to you need to give me a Madman Atomics piece and just go to town like Jim did. Yeah, we'll do, man. <laughs> Jim, I use yours. <laughs> When, when, whenever it was, hey, what do you want? Well, how about something like this? And they're like, ah! That's a good endorsement. <laughs> yes. So, or so show up Barry Smith, Barry Windsor Smith, go, or that, <laughs> just a lone figure. <laughs> nice to be in the same sentence as Barry Windsor Smith, by the way. Yes, sir. Went, oh, man, he's why I started doing comics full time. Do, do we have time for one quick? Absolutely. Split? 
Okay, this 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 is okay. So, graduated from high school. Uh, 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 Dad got me a summer job as a lifeguard at at this uh, summer camp. So to get me out of the house, it was in two sections. Half of the summer, one group of kids a little a week's break and then the second session for the rest of the summer so i'm stuck out in the woods but then on the break i go into town and in this used bookstore this is before i ever saw a comic book store it was a uh called book fair and in the back in a box was every barry smith conan comic book for 250 dollars. now my summer wage for the whole summer was 500 dollars and i saw all of these now i had seen uh lee had like uh barry smith conan illustration on a marvel calendar i'd seen bits here and there and was just loved it and would see like you, you know foom oh yeah so i would i would always see barry smith stuff and like i love this guy but never remember back in the day if you didn't get it off the racks you were d good luck unless your friend got it or you found it something like this and there was a, 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 a secondhand store that Lee and I would buy our comics for five cents each. And he, uh, anyway, so we, that's how we would build up our collections with that at the secondhand store. So at this point, seeing all of them there together like that, there, I had to have it. And so I bought, bought them, uh, every, uh, you know, every Barry Smith Conan. And um, then something came up where I had to pay something for college. And dad was like, um, well, you have this. And I was like, actually, <laughs> actually, I spent half of my, my money already, like on what? And it was like Jack and Jack and the Beanstalk where, hey, look at these magic beans right. that I got. You sold the cow? <laughs> sold the cow for beans? That was my dad's reaction that I showed him these comic books, maybe fair to near mint some of them. And which I wasn't even a thing in my head at that point, but I'm like, yes, these are precious. These are, these are going to be what will tell the tale of the rest of my life. And he um, was livid. And uh, so from that moment on, it was my purpose in life to prove that that was a, a valuable purchase. And so, uh, when I became a professional and found an old spinner rack in a warehouse, cleaned it up and painted it and stuff. It's the Hey Kids comic spinner rack. I, you know, with the plexiglass things, I put all my Barry Smith in there. And, and that was another thing. When I quit broadcasting to do comics full time, again, dad, like, what? I'm sure. What are you doing? And like, this is, I got to do this, dad. I got to do this. And so, um, he lived long enough to show, to, to see uh, me, first of all, the first step was within the first two years where I was and showed him the checks that Kevin Eastman was writing me. <laughs> and I was like, it's working out, dad, it's working out. And then over time, he's like, you know, I'm really proud of you. I, uh, you really did good with this. And those, uh, those Barry Smith Conans only leave that spinner rack for me to revisit them. So that spinner rack is my magic beanstalk. Dig. That's, That's awesome. Fantastic. That's an awesome uh, note to end it on, man. Mike, thanks so much. Do you want to point the audience in a direction on social media or anything? Website? Um, triple A pop, A A A P O P dot com is the first place to connect everywhere else. Um, I just started on threads, uh, Instagram. It's always all red MD. Um, a L L R E D M D. Uh, Twitter, all red MD. I don't do Facebook. Laura has a Facebook account. Um, I had one and it, and it got weird. Um, and so I don't, it might still be there, but I don't do anything with Facebook. But L Laura has a Facebook account and I will check on there and, and comment on there. Um, and it's Instagram's probably where I have the most fun. That's where I'll, I'll post stuff like this or, or uh, the different builds. I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I, I made a Mandalorian Starfighter vehicle, one six scale, you know, uh, 3D printed the pieces and sanded it and resin and everything and lit it up, electronics all through it. Um, so that's that's how I get loose with, I'll, I'll build something, I'll go build a deck or or something or, or a toy uh, and then back to the drawing board. 
That's fun, man. Yeah. Mike, thanks so much, man, for coming through. Thank you. Favors, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell so that we could notify you when new videos are available. We are a daily YouTube channel with more than 1,600 videos at your disposal. We might have talked about your favorite comics. Go on the front page of the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel, hit the magnifying glass, search for your favorite uh, titles, check out those episodes. But if we did not cover your favorite comics, just let us know in the comments and we will push those comics a little bit higher on our to-read pile. We have a Patreon where the King Kayfabers mitigate the Kayfabe effect by getting in early. They get all the videos before anybody else. And, uh, you know, if you're uh, awake, available, and at a computer or some sort of online device, you get to hang out with us in uh, the live stream recording session that we are doing. And we've got about 50 people in there right now, Jimmy. So it's small, it's intimate, it's private. But they're also the people getting the comics before anybody else has the uh, the option to do so. Ultimately, the videos are brought to you by... The books that we make, you don't buy our books, we can't make videos, man, can't keep the lights on in the in the, in the the studio. So before you is a smattering of the books that we have out there, but let's get into the details. Jimmy, what do you have? Hulk Grand Design, this is the treasury collection that is actually out of print. If your store still has one of these and you don't, you want to scoop that up. But good news, Marvel is reprinting this for a May release this year. It will be a trade paperback format, so uh, kind of the mass media version or the mass market version, and uh, you can pick that one up. You can pre-order that one now wherever you buy books or comics. I have also been self-publishing some zines and mini-comics, the BW zine celebrating the Black and White Explosion, the 1986 zine celebrating the greatest year in comics, and True Crime Funnies, three nonfiction stories, a couple of wrestling stories in addition to your typical true crime kind of crime comic. You can get those on jimrug.com or patreon.com slash jimrug. And my latest book releases, Street Angel Princess of Poverty and Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive, collecting the adventures of the homeless ninja on a skateboarder. We have a full color version and we have some of the original comics as they originally appeared in black and white. Those are both now available from Image Comics. I'm doing a new experiment for 2024. I'm serializing daily comic strips on all my social media, including the uh, Cartoonist Kayfabe social media. Uh, it's called Switchblade Shorties. These are some of the more recent strips that, that I drew, have yet to scan them in and, and get them to look like they will in the final book publication. But uh, hit any of my social media up for that, and you could check out us at Switchblade Shorties that way. I put, I'll put i put videos out on Saturdays on the Kayfabe channel with reading the week's prior uh, Switchblade comics. X-Men Grand Design Trilogy Trade Paperback collects all the X-Men Grand Design comics that I did. Uh, this is the third round of Red Room comics in trade paperback form. It's called Crypto Killers, and it comes out uh, January 14th. So uh, scoop that comic up sooner than later. There's a limited number of those out there, and there are also a limited number of the Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus books uh, out there right now. It's been climbing on the uh, Amazon charts in a big way the past couple of weeks. I've I seen it uh, on a lot of people's uh, Instagram stories when uh, the, the holidays came through. So uh, we've got a very nominal amount of these books left. Scoop them up if you see them. Uh, it's the best book I made with a lot of extras that um, give you a reason to buy the book beyond uh, if you if you have those original volumes. Uh, like I said before, the books are the uh, most important way to keep the channel rocking, but there are some direct ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Jimmy, if you'll let the people know. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, and uh, more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. There you have it. All the ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel and keep things rocking in 2024. Give them those marching orders, Jimmy, and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.